When I was a young girl in China, my Shanghai Papa told me, bamboo is flexible, bending with wing but never break. Your ability to thrive depends on your attitude, taking everything in stride with grace. Let me first take you back to 1966 at the dawn of Cultural Revolution. And I was eight years old. I was raised in this loving family by my Shanghai papa and mama. And I have five older siblings. I was the youngest. My name is Ping. In Chinese, it means little apple. And this is the story of little apple coming to the big apple <laughs> to tell you something that happened 40 years ago. Cultural Revolution was started by Mao to prosecute entrepreneurs and intellectuals. So at 1966, he decided to close all of the schools and um, turn the country upside down. I already knew something has happened around the neighborhood. My German neighbor disappeared, some family being broken by those teenagers that, that I called red guards. Um, and since school is closed, the teenagers are roaming around the country and they can go into any family. One day, um, I heard loud sound. I heard boots coming in to our courtyard. I saw they were coming to my parents, and little did I know they were came for me. I was in my grandpa's library with floor-to-ceiling mahogany drawers that um, store a lot of Chinese book that I spent a lot of my young years in there. I heard my mom crying and saying, she is so small, she's so little. And I peeked my head out. I heard the red guard say, she's there, catch her. I realized it was coming for me, so I ran back into the library, tried to hide, but there was no place to hide. They came to take me away from the only family that I knew and I was told that day my Shanghai Papa Mama was not my birth parents. My birth parents living in Nanjing, about 300 miles south of Shanghai, and I was going to be taken to Nanjing to stay with my birth parents. And I was crying and screaming and saying, you're lying, she's my parents, uh, she's my mom, because I really love my Shanghai mom. She's just the most loving mom anyone could ever have. She's a great chef and she always said she puts love in her food. I screamed at her, I said, you're lying, you're my mom, you just told me last week I was your favorite. And she said, Ping, don't fight. I was deprived to have my last hug with my mom when I was taken away and put on this really, really crowded train to go to Nanjing. And I arrived in Nanjing just a little too late to see my biological parents being put on a truck and taken away very far, far away. My father was away for 12 years. And I saw the dust uh, behind the truck and I saw my mom's head popping in and out among a lot of people in the back of the truck and she shouted at me, Ping, please take care of your sister. Then I was taken to the dormitory when the school was shut down, and my dad was an aerospace uh, aeronautic professor. The university was shut down, so I was taken to this room. There I found my little sister. She was four years old. The room was full of trash, and there was no water basin, there was no bed. It looked like garbage can. The only shining spot was under her leg, because she was kicking her little legs and polish 
the concrete floor. And her eye was so red, I thought she was going to go blind. So little did I know that this was the room that I spent next 10 years um, there. For the first five years I was there, from 8 to 13, I didn't have any parents. I didn't have any adult supervision. That one day, I lost the parent who born me, the parent who raised me, and I became surrogate mother to my daughter, or to my, I keep calling her daughter, to my younger sister. And then when I was 10 years old, my sister was thrown into a water canal, and I jumped in, tried to save her, and I did save her, but I was not spared. I was gang raped by um, 10 or 12, I don't remember, a gang of red guards. And they left me on the field to die, and I was cut up also. I had broken tailbones. I was cut up so badly, I still have 40 stitches uh, on me. Um, I didn't actually understand what happened. I passed out. Um, when I was saved by a kind nurse and brought back to the wrong to nurse myself, I thought about dying. I thought about the life was not worth living, but I had a little sister to take care of. I couldn't just die. And it was in my bed I remembered what my un uncle told me about Three Friends of Winter and, and the little piece I played for you at the beginning. Bamboo is a flexible bending from prevailing wing but never break. My uncle told me that you must be bamboo, and that's what gave me the strength. And then about 13 years old, um, my journal was burned right in front of my eye. So when I was young, I had no friends and no, no parents, and I, I wrote letters to my parents, and I have no address to send them. So I started to write journals on the back of the communist propaganda sheet so it won't be discovered. And my journal was my only friends because my journal is who I can talk to. My journal is where I put my feelings and my thoughts on the paper. But it was found, discovered by Red Guard, and they burned it. I'm sorry. Um, that was like taking my life away. That's like burning my best friend. Um, so today, I wrote my book not because who I am today, but because I was once nobody. And my journal was once burned. And I developed a skin rash that every time if I take the pen, I literally would get skin rash on my hand. So I couldn't write anything for a very, very long time. And it took a lot of courage and encouragement from friends to put my story on the paper. And I'm glad I did it. So fast forwarding, um, fast forwarding 10 years, Cultural Revolution ended, and uh, Mao died, Cultural Revolution ended, and China reopened for university. Um, I was known as the girl whose lights never turned off. I had passed national exam and got into the university. I wanted to be an astronaut, and, but I didn't have any choice. My father was still in the Russian border cutting trees. I was assigned to study Chinese literature. And my mom said, no, don't do that. You're going to get in trouble. And I did not care. I wanted to go to school. Because during Cultural Revolution, I did not go to K-12. to I did not have formal education. I worked in the factory building radios and um, speedometers for cars. I went to the university, studied Chinese literature. That was incredibly thrilling experience. I loved it. And before graduation, I was supposed to write a thesis. So I chose a humanitarian topic. At the time, China was imposing one-child policy, so um, you can only have one child. In countryside, the farmers want a son. And at that time, China still was an agricultural society. 80% of people are farmers. I heard there's widespread of killing baby girls in the countryside. Um, so I thought I'd go do uh, some research and, and use that as my graduation thesis. And I see horror. I saw 
baby girls being thrown into the river when their umbilical cord still fresh. I saw baby girls being put in a plastic bag and thrown into the garbage. I saw hundreds of such um, cases, and it broke my heart. So I wrote a report on the widespread killing and calling for stop the killing, and my research was um, published on some Chinese newspaper because the Chinese government also was calling, sorry, for stop the killing. And, and little did I know that got pick up, picked up by international um, press and then generated all cry for human rights violation. And this was the new Chinese government just came in power and I embarrassed our government. So I become a scapegoat. 100 days before graduation, I was thrown into jail, into a dark room with no windows, no water, no food, no bed. The room smelled like pneumonia, literally make my eye watery. I thought that I was going to be killed, but why now, when my life just turned around, when I just start to love what I'm doing? But then I thought, it's OK. My sister is grown up now, I, and my parents were back, and I can die, even though I didn't want to. I'm kind of lucky because Cultural Revolution ended, and I was released, and I was asked to leave the country and never to come back. Because they didn't know what to do with me, and I really didn't do anything wrong. Um, I was told not to apply for political asylum, but go be a student. I applied in many countries. United States was the first country accepted me. So I got a visa to go to University of New Mexico to study English as a second language. I left China, didn't know I would ever see my family again. I tried to study English, I never studied English before. Um, I tried to memorize words, and by the time I got to San Francisco, I only remember three. And that's hello, thank you, help. <laughs> three very helpful words. Um, when I was in San Francisco, I had $80 traveler's check to buy the tra um, ticket from San Francisco to New Mexico, because that's the price I um, checked when I was in Shanghai. When I arrived, the ticket was $85. And I could, I don't have any money, I was penniless. Blessing San Francisco, there's a lot of Chinese speaking people, and so one of the Chinese speaking agents described to me what's going on, and an American man standing behind me giving $5 to the counter so I could buy the ticket. That was my first impression of America that the people are very generous and helpful. Five dollars may not mean much to him, but it meant work to me. And from that, I learned why in doubt always err on the side of generosity. So I got to New Mexico and then study, uh, tried to study English. Um, when you have to survive in this society, when you have nowhere to go, you study language pretty quickly. <laughs> And I was also quite good with language, but still not enough to study literature. And I also found my teacher who studied literature couldn't find a job, so I don't have the luxury. I need to find a marketable job, a marketable field. I asked around and say, what can I study? Since I didn't go to K-12, I have no math and science background. I can't study English or comparative literature. It feels like the door just slammed on my face once again. One of the naive students said, why don't you go check out computer science? It's a new field. And I said, what's that? And that was early 80s. Um, he said, it's man-made language that makes stuff. <laughs> I go like, great, I'm good with language, and I know how to make stuff. That's what I'm <laughs> going to study. And I studied computer science, and um, I quickly realized I was a very bad programmer. Um, but I was a very good software designer. You know, programmer are the people who write code. Software designer tells what that code does. Um, I had no idea a software designer was a higher job than a programmer. Um, being not good in programming, being computer science was a collaborative, collaborative project-based study. 
I went to find the best programmer to work for me, um, with me, and I designed the project. Usually, is better than um, the techie guys, because like one of the project we were supposed to do the logic for lights. Everybody was writing program. We went to Radio Shack and bought all the pieces and built the real lights, um, because that's my background. I worked in the factory, um, so. A lot of students love to work with me, and I always buy them Coke and m ms to bribe them <laughs> to, to write the best code. So, so I, I cursed cruise through school with actually A or A plus by doing that. Um, I, I thought it was a, my survival skill. I did not know that's called servant's leadership. Uh, so, so quick forward that I um, later, I worked for a startup company a little bit, and I went to Bell Labs, and then later I landed in National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and I hired a student, his name is Mark Andres, and nobody knows who he is, and I paid him $6.75 an hour for three years, he's still complaining, and then later he, uh, he's a very bright, uh, ambitious uh, undergraduate student, and he said he's going to quit school to go start uh, a company, I said, please, Mark, don't quit. Finish your school. He says, well, Bill Gates quit school. I said, yeah, Bill Gates already did that. You need to be Bill Gates but with a degree. <laughs> and so he did finish his school and went to start Netscape. Rest is history. And I stayed um, at the university. A year or two later, I started Geomagic. And people say, you know, why do you start Geomagic? Really, I was a reluctant reluctant entrepreneur. I had a daughter who was three years old at the time. I didn't really want to start a business. I was brainwashed by the communists thinking making money is evil. And I also had a misconception. I think that entrepreneurs are the people who hate their job, and I loved my job. Um, but I started because we had so much talk at university. Everybody was talking about starting business. We brought in consultants, venture capitalists, the lawyers, you name it. But nobody did anything because we have 10 years. Come on. Um, so my boss was really frustrated. He says, all this talk, no action. So I said, OK, I'll start one. And no idea what I was getting into. I started Geomagic and thought, you know, I'm going to hire someone, run back into the university two years later, and have my good life. And that didn't happen that way. Start a business is kind of like giving birth to baby. You can't put it back to your stomach. Uh, so, <laughs> so I started Geomagic. And it was internet high, and it was very, very easy to raise money. And I decided I wanted to start a company that combined internet with industrial, um, not technology, just old industrial thing, like handcraftsmanship, because I love handcrafted arts and, and the products. And for thousands of years, we humans have made things by hand. And I was in the sick of the internet revolution. I said, you know, how about we combine those two? And I didn't know how to combine them, so I went out to look. And one day, I saw this demo by Chuck Hall, who's the founder of 3D System, was showing this machine called the stereolithography machine. You can't even kind of pronounce that. But it, it's a 3D printer. And I, and I was mesmerized by that. I said, oh my god, this is what I want to do. I ran back to my office and realized I really don't know how to build a 3D printer, but I know how to write software. OK, I thought, well. If a 2D printer needs Microsoft and Adobe, Adobe, then 3D printer will need Geomagic. Yeah, mm, so what do you do with 3D printer? And I went out to raise money, and I just made up stories. I said, imagine walking to Nike Town, get your foot scanned, and get a custom pair of shoes. Tomorrow, I have one on my feet. It's not Nike, but it's you know, Lady Gaga-like shoe. Um, <laughs> and I said, imagine walking into a also, Dantic's office, watching the animation of your daughter's teeth for the next two years. And then later, Invisalign, if you know about Invisalign, correcting teeth with our wires and brackets, that's our technology. And I am you know, currently helping my company to produce uh, several lines of shoes that are not only beautiful or lightweight, but it's custom made to your feet, right? So it doesn't hurt. Like, I'm on six feet inches here, yeah. Lady Gaga is on 12 inches. But it's, it's not only custom fit to the arches of your feet, but it's also custom fit to the way you stand, the way you walk. And it doesn't matter if your left foot does, is not the same size as the right. 
Um, so Geomagic was out there to try to combine internet technology with, with manufacturing and that grew from making custom product to medical devices to NASA space shuttle. You know, little, I was the little girl always dreamed about flying. I wanted to be an astronaut. I end up starting a company contributing technology that's used by every space shuttle now to guarantee the safety return of astronaut. Life does come back to the full circle. And we also did scanning of Statue of Liberty. You know, I grew up in, a, in China at the darkest period of modern history where freedom of speech is not there. And I end up to help US government to preserve the very symbol of freedom. And so, so that's my story. Um, I wanted to talk about, since this one is about happiness, right? I thought about like my life, do I really even understand happiness? And when I was young, I didn't believe that I deserved to be happy. I, I was brainwashed and told and made on stage to scream to everyone that I was nobody. I was a bug beneath your feet. That after you say that a thousand times, you start to believe that. And what does happiness even mean to someone like me who have lived through a life of darkness? For me, it's all those little bright things in life that I encounter. When I was young, it was the little act of kindness. Um, people show to me, that makes me happy. It's little beauty that I found in the ugliness that makes me happy. I remember coming into that dormitory, that ghetto room that I lived, which was very dark. All the doors were purposely broken so that we don't have pri privacy. And I would watch those broken doors hanging there like soldiers, and in my mind, I would make up ghost stories, fly, like those ghosts were flying around me. And, I, and there was a little light at the end of the hallway that's broken and kind of hang like a person on the side, sleepy. And I remember in my mind painting picture, a sculpture of Picasso. And those little moments brings me happiness. And then later in my life when I got into where I am today, giving advice to President Obama or sitting in Michelle's box, I thought about, did I arrive? Like people ask, when do you feel you arrived? And I thought about that. I think that you never actually arrive. It's always a journey. And in my book, I wrote about mountain, uh, life is like a mountain range. So you go up and down. And I start to use that as a metaphor of life is a mountain range. And I find that metaphor bring me a lot, a lot more happiness. Let me describe what it is. In America, a lot of time we get brainwashed. Um, going up is good and going down is bad. And if you think about the metaphor we use, like corporate letters, glass ceiling, it's always like, Going up is the symbol of success. But when you travel, you want to go to a different peak of the mountain because the view is different. You don't want to be just on one peak. You just don't want to just go one place. And if your life is a mountain range, you want to go to a different peak to see different view, to have different experience, then you have to go down before you can go up. Now, if you have that kind of metaphor in your mind, then you wouldn't mind if there is a setback in life, right? Like my life totally shows that behind every closed door, there's open space. If I didn't come to the United States, if I sp spoke more than three English and I had a better English, I probably would have never studied computer science and I probably wouldn't never started the company today. So there's a lot of little incidents that I have in my life is that going down is really not a bad thing. So I actually took many jobs that had a less, lesser of title and got paid less. But because 
it's something that I want to do. And then it's, you know, if I get bored by my, my job, I wanted to take another job, I don't mind that it paid less as, as long as I can arrive at a place the experience is better. I, I believe you can always make money. Um, but, and, then, and also like in life, you can't, life is messy, Pe people are messy. You can't really control what life throw at you. It's just not in your control. It's kind of like space shuttle goes to the space, there's something always gonna hit the insulation tire. You can't control that. But what we can control is how we feel about it. And what we can control is what kind of day we have. We do decide when we get up in the morning, what do we do today? So I, today, I, in, in my little badge that happiness is, I said, an interesting day. Um, today, when I run Geomagic, people a lot of time ask me, you know, what kind of company do you want to build? And I said, it's all about love. And I say it's all about love because the only kind of company I want to build is the one that people coming in the morning, they love what they do and they love who they work with. And if they don't love what they do and they don't like the people they are working with, they're wasting their time and they're not the people I wanted to be in the company and they're not going to be the one who will create magic for the customers or partners or anyone who's encountered with us. But how do you get people who come in to, to carry that kind of culture? Sometimes I have people come in and ask me, Ping, you know, I'm kind of feeling stuck. What can I do? And, and I thought about what to say and I thought about my own happiness and I come down to three things. Everybody have their own version of happiness, so this is not religion, it's just my version. Um, I think about three things. One is pleasure, one's flow, and meaning. So those are three words, pleasure, flow, meaning. Pleasure are little things that I do for myself. Taking a shower, get a massage, go to a show, fall in love. Flow is what I do. You know, I wanted to love what I do so much I forgot time. You all have that experience, right? You do something that you're so into it, you don't, you don't remember time pass by. That's called the flow, it's a, a, not my term, it's a psychological term. Meaning is about being in something that bigger than yourself, about contributing to your family, community, society, earth, universe. If you have all three, if I have all three, I believe that I will be happy. It doesn't mean they are equal weight, I don't do balance. Um, it just means if I'm not happy, if I got stuck, I can ask my question, which part is missing? You know, am I not happy because I'm not taking care of myself, I'm working too much, I'm really tired? Am I not happy because I'm, I'm in a job that I don't love? Or am I not happy because I really wanted to do something bigger and I'm not doing it? Pretty simple thing to ask. So I tell this to my employees and they find it very helpful and I give that to you. Pleasure, flow, and meaning. Thank you.